over Saar, is she? No. Okonkwo gets it off right in the nick of time. And that's a, the start that you want to see from Amy Okonkwo being aggressive intensity on offense and on defense. You see Amy here taking it to the basket. That's her first basket of the game. Okoke gets it back and has it taken away by Dillard, who's in midcourt now. Bounce pass beautifully to Saar, who finishes nicely. And that was two days ago. Balagoon hits a three-pointer. This is it. Look okay. And they're going to count it. Taiwo beats set, and you can count it. So she is has a COVID option? year left. Yeah, I think it's an option for her. But I think she already signed and committed to a team in Spain. And three-pointer for Pui. In other words, well, there's still the potential of uh, Sierra Dillard having a big second half, but her contributions have been limited somewhat. Yes, has 10 points. Dillard from deep. It just makes you smile, doesn't it? Dillard probing, finding her way inside. Try a wide open three. That's more like it for. I don't know why they stopped it, but right here they're just playing low, and that's exactly what she's going to do. Dillard for three. She is fouled as well by Okoro. A four point play opportunity. Her coming off of the screen and just pulling up. Amy Okonkwo is too low. You know Dillard is a shooter. If you're not going to hard edge, you have to be ready to, to challenge a shot. And the drive and a chance for a three-point play. Cora, what an answer for her. Senegal could use an easy bucket or two. Yeah. Everything is such a struggle. Way for three. That's finally getting something to go. Yeah, Senegal needs to attack the basket. They're just settling for jump shots after jump shots. Attack the basket just oh, like that. There you go. Wow, reverse. She made her previous four. There's Balagoon. Oh, big time shot. Balagoon puts it up, another three for her. And they're gonna do it relatively comfortably in the end. 84 to 74, Nigeria, the Tigress. The powerhouse. So, once again, Nigeria at the top of the podium. Well, they're on top of this podium. There are no levels, but you get the point. So the national anthem has been played. Celebrating the Tigress there for what they did over there at the BK Arena in Kigali for the final against Senegal, making it four pits and celebrating them right now. We just have to appreciate what those ladies did 
in Rwanda. Welcome you on the show. We can sport on Trust CV um, at Deni uh, G. Shafe. It's time to, to take you around the world of sport as we look at those activities trending. Matches south for football, talking about Europe is back, like Premier League, like Liga, uh, even French League on. All of them will be looking at those games later for this weekend. And as we speak right now, the match between Australia and France is getting so tough because both of them, they are yet to score. It's still nil-nil over there in Australia. Big one out there. Just giving you an update concerning that particular match. Well, we just have to look at uh, those stories. For our ladies, the Tigress, it was a fantastic performance from them. And Nigerians can't stop celebrating them for what they did. Super Falcons still tried their best, but they lost out against England in that game there at the World Cup. Right now, let's start with uh, handball. We have a handball story that has to do with our team. They are doing well over there in Cote d'Ivoire. Handball, Nigeria to face Guinea in the final after beating Rwanda at I HF uh, Women's Trophy Africa Continental. They did well uh, getting to this final after beating Rwanda, Madagascar, and also Guinea. White watching all the three teams they met on their way. They will do their way to the final, and right now they'll be facing Guinea today by 3 p.m. in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, for the final of this competition. IHF, International Handball Federation Women's Trophy, Africa Continental, Nigeria under 18 girls are making us proud and hopefully. They can do this again. After all, they've met with Guinea before. They defeated them. So the second one, they should be able to ride over. Although not being complacent should be in their mind. They just have to do it to make Nigerians proud. Really, ladies are making us proud when it comes to sport. You look at the Tigress Super Falcons, the uh, handball team. That's the under-18 handball team right now. We also saw how our wrestlers are doing so well. When it comes to sport, uh, Nigerian women are really not lagging behind. They are making us so proud. We are proud of them for what they are doing so far when it comes to uh, the sports. Uh, every sport that they actually participate, be in athletics, be in football, in every sport, Nigerian women are really making us so proud. Well, right now, uh, we'll be looking at uh, a particular particular uh, topic, although we'll be waiting for our guests to join us from Lagos. That's Kelechi. Uh, Kelechi Favor is there to join us concerning unicycle sport development in Nigeria. This is a sport that is really catching a lot of uh, uh, momentum. A lot of uh, Nigerians are beginning to go into unicycle, uh, unicycling sport. Uh, Kelechi Favor, are you there? Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, I'm there. Good morning. Yes, good to have you on the show. Let's talk about unicycling sports, uh, the one you have been uh, at least uh, pushing one way or the other. You are a coach and you're also an athlete of uh, unicycling. Let's uh, focus on that particular topic with uh, Kelechi uh, Favor from Lagos. Uh, Kelechi, a lot of people uh, might just be seeing this sport for the first time or some people see it as just fun sport. But uh, the way it is, it's an international sport and it's really gaining momentum. Some Nigerians are beginning to go into it. Give us uh, updates concerning unicycling. Okay, so unicycling is a one-way sport and um, it's gaining momentum here in Nigeria because uh, as a, uh, let's say about an hour ago, we just finished our morning training. So we are having more awareness. There are people developing more interest into joining and the sport is growing and growing within the country and it's a very great one. Okay. Uh, for the fact that you said, so we hope to push it further. We are working on some uh, some alignment, some coalition with different bodies in the cycling federation to see how we can make it bigger or possibly include it into the national sport festival or some sporting bodies that can help promote the sport within Nigeria and Africa. A good one. Uh, as you said, that uh, you are trying to align with the Fed to see how they can get a federation. I'm sure the federation is yet to come up, but hopefully that will be done. But now let's look yes. at the acceptance in the society uh, over there in Lagos. How, how is this sport? Uh, I, I can see young ones there trying to at least practice uh, uni, uh, unicycle. Yes, the acceptance is very encouraging. At first, it wasn't really encouraging because of the nature of the sport. Since it's not something that people really see around. At first, they're having this notion that is this something you are doing with some magical powers or the like, until I was able to teach my first students. That was when the acceptance came in, and they're like, wow, okay, it's natural. Because the assumption was that it was the supernatural powers and the like. So after teaching my first students, the acceptance grew, and the more kids are more younger, the people, people well advanced adults start showing interest in it, and they are moving gradually. 
Okay, uh, apart from Lagos, uh, you, you've taken these spots elsewhere. Apart from Lagos in Nigeria, has it moved to other cities? I have a colleague in Abuja, he's also a coach. His name is Konami. He has been gaining ground in Abuja. So he also coached some students at Abuja, I think, Dabi Lake area. So he's a very good colleague of mine, and we work together. We are actually in synchrony, trying to see how we can push this sport for that make it recognize how we can align with the Ministry of Youth and Sport, align with some other bodies to help grow it. You know, collaboration makes things work faster and better. Okay. Uh, uh, now, uh, talking about this uh, unicycling, looking at that particular unicycle there, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be very expensive uh, from the way it is. Uh, yes. Yeah. Actually, that was also a major challenge because having to buy it is really expensive coding dollars. It's not something made in Nigeria. So having to import it uh, with what the, uh, the dollar is saying because we realize it's in Naira is crazy. An average is actually cost around eighty dollars to one fifty dollars. So like most of the ones I used, I got them at like one twenty dollars. But those that was when the dollar was supposed to sell like five hundred naira per uh, five hundred naira to one dollar. So right now the price is really crazy. So, but I try to buy ahead of time, buy in book, and we wait a long time for it to be shipped down here. Okay, and I, I can also see the kids there going to like something like choreography. Uh, you can match uh, unicycling with choreography, kind of, right? Yes, so unicycle basically has two dimensions you can push it towards. The artistic dimension, which is the circles and the dancing, and just like what you are saying right now. Where you can use to perform different kinds of arts, synchronized choreography, juggling, drumming on the unicycle, skipping, different kinds of hybrids. Why the second dimension is the sport dimension, where we have the unicycle racing, the different kind of racing, under the carriage, marathon, unicycle, the unicycle hockey, the unicycle basketball. That's a sport that's really prominent in Europe. They do a lot of unicycle basketball and unicycle hockey. So there are two major dimensions of the unicycle. The artistic dimension and the sport dimension. So I try to work my students through both dimensions to help them cope wherever they find themselves tomorrow. So we do it both yeah, the artistic we've been talking with and the sport dimension. Uh, this morning, we just finished the training on so, sport dimension. Uh, like. Athletes really try to see how they can develop this sport. It's really very interesting. You look at the uh, the athletes there. The unicyclists really enjoying themselves in choreography and also uh, competing in that particular sport. Now, before I let you go, as it, as it is, as a sport that you a lot of uh, you want Nigerians to go into right now. Uh, I know it's going to be tough. How tough is it, uh, you know, to learn? Uh, let's say for like two weeks or a month, you can get to understand how to ride that particular unicycle. Less than a month. Say an average person, two weeks. An average person, two weeks. I thought it, I thought one that I was able to learn in about five days. Wow. The guy is a genius, trust me. I was surprised. <laughs> He's a genius. His name is Shehu. I had to give him a unicycle. Because I was really impressed by his face and by his level of, of artistic coordination. It was really amazing. While some people who are quite, uh, like, probably scared or they have some disability to take them longer time. And from my observation, it took, it takes kids a faster time to learn than adults. And I think that's something natural. Kids already have much going on in their heads than I think when you're younger, you have better acceleration. So, from my personal observation of coaching, you can learn faster than adults. Uh, we appreciate your Although time with us to give us insight to the sports of unicycling. Sport. Thank you so much, Kelechi. <laughs> At least uh, we just have Kelechi favor there. Just to give you an insight, uh, just say people concerning that sport is really a gaining momentum. A lot of young ones, just now that the kids are home for holidays, they can go into that sport and also keep themselves busy. Unicycling, before you know it, it should turn to a big one. Nigeria has never taken the last uh, stride when it comes to sport. And I'm very sure that was how tech ball came and now it's gaining momentum now. Unicycling is also are uh, getting notice across Nigeria. Now, let's quickly go to that segment where we give you those things you think you know and you don't know at all. Let's talk about the uh, Did You Know segment.
Good to have you back. We're talking about uh, those uh, uh, stories that you actually get to know about those sportsmen and women. Good one for the digress. They're really making us proud. Right now, let's look at if you love sport. At least this particular uh, uh, story will actually inspire you because if you look at how much they end, you want to go into sport. Let's look at the world's highest paid athletes. Before we go into football, let's quickly look at uh, uh, what top 10 highest paid athletes for 2023 so far between now, uh, between January to August. Uh, these are the highest paid athletes so far in the world. Ronaldo topping the list there with $136 million. Lionel Messi, $130 million. Kylian Mbappe of PSG, uh, $120 20 million. LeBron James, the basketballer, 119.5. Following uh, Kylian Mbappe, standing number four there. Canelo Alvarez, a boxer, 110 million pounds, uh, rather dollars. Dustin Johnson, a golfer, 107. Phil Mickelson, another golfer, 106 million dollars that he has made this year. Stephen Curry, basketballer, 100.4 million dollars. Roger Federer, tennis player, uh, 95.1 million dollars. And you have Kevin Durant, who plays in the NBA as a basketballer, earning $89.1 million. Just to give you that particular list of top 10 paid highest, uh, uh, highest paid athletes in 2023. Good one for all of them. Uh, really, they are costing home, cashing in, as you say it here. But really, uh, they're cashing out either way. But hopefully, a lot of young stars out there can take into sport and also make cool cash to help their families when it comes to sport. Now, right now, let's quickly talk about uh, games that at least uh, happened just yesterday. League openers, it's a lot of matches were played across Europe. We look at league openers, uh, Man City playing against Burnley was a 3-0. They actually pick up the birds and where they drop it last season after winning the league. You look at in Spain, Almeria lost against Valicano, 2-0 there. You have uh, Al-Ali defeating Al-Azam over there in Saudi Arabia. League would one for Al-Ali. The likes of Firmino scoring the hat trick there. Born lead against Man City was 3 0. Man City was able to win that game. And their robotic striker, as they call him now, Ellie Haaland, scoring the brace there. This time around, someone said it's like this guy who scored 60 goals this season. For Lille versus OGC, Nister and Murphy, he was uh, at least uh, on assist there. When what it ended, Sevilla Valencia, 2 1 favor of Sevilla Valencia, a visiting team at the ex stadio Ramon Sanchez. Inter Miami against Charlotte, uh, talking about uh, Lionel Messi against uh, his team, against Charlotte there. You look at Messi and Ronaldo effect on those leagues. How the Arabian League and uh, US uh, Major League Soccer is getting so much attention right now. Just to give you updates on those games that we play in the match openers, especially in Europe. Well, for Manchester City, uh, they've started well so far. 3 0 against Burnley at Toughmore yesterday. They really did well as they won that game. Uh, well, looking at their main man, Ellie Haaland, scoring two out of the uh, three goals. Uh, well, Rodri adding another one for Ellie Haaland. He won't stop scoring right now. He has started on a very good note right now, scoring two goals there. And for Manchester City, really, uh, you saw the master teaching his boy <laughs> uh, football style there. You look at that game, three goals were scored on target eight touches on opposition boss 23 possession 65 uh for manchester city and you look at 696 passes coming from them they're really making waves when it comes to football congrats to them starting well on that note there well taking us to premier league fixtures for this weekend you look at so many matches will be coming up let's look at those games slated for this weekend in the uh, english premier league uh then we'll talk about it with uh, charles adua is already on standby but let's look at the fixtures for this weekend
with one of the athletes to have a feel of matches slated for this weekend in those three leagues, La Liga, French League, and also Premier League, even though that started yesterday, and all that matches. Now, we'll be focusing on those uh, league matches for this weekend. And now we have uh, Charles Adria joining us from Bern, Switzerland, where we'll be talking uh, football together. Well, good to have you on the show, Charles. Good to be here again once again, Nick. Okay, good to have you. Let's talk about uh, Premier League that started like a child's play yesterday. It was a good one for Man City against uh, Burnley at Tough Moor. You saw the master Shifu <laughs> as uh, Guardiola defeating uh, his former player uh, there. Well, they won that game 3-0. But let's look at matches for uh, this weekend. A lot of games will be coming up. Uh, we look at Arsenal be playing against Nottingham Forest, at least uh, a big one there. And you have uh, Bournemouth, West Ham, Brighton and Luton Town, Everton, Fulham, Sheffield United, Crystal Palace, Axton Villa away to uh, Newcastle at St. James Park. You have Brentford against Tottenham All Sport, who won't be without uh, uh, their striker. Well, who has right now joined Bayern there? That's talking about Harry Kane and Chelsea, Liverpool. Uh, well, I think the biggest match for this weekend is between Chelsea and Liverpool. Uh, Charles, uh, maybe you should just focus on that first before we touch on others. Chelsea, Liverpool for this weekend, if the biggest match so far. How will you see this game? Yeah, rightly so, as you said, this is the biggest match of the season. So far, yes, granted, this is the first weekend. But I think there are many things riding on this game for both teams. You could say both teams are going into the season unsettled or unsure about their scores, especially in terms of the midfield. You see Chelsea are actively looking for a defense. In fact, both teams are actively looking for a defensive midfielder. And as we all know, over the past, should I say, 36 hours, there's been a lot going on about Moses Caicedo going to Liverpool. Is he going to Chelsea? Is he going to Liverpool? So I think those factors will also have an impact on the game. Um, I think there's going to be that mental. I think word now is he's likely to join Chelsea and Chelsea are trying to present him on Sunday before the game. So those extra bits of emotional, should I say, factors there. Further to that, you also see the obvious Liverpool have got some... Um, so Bosai, got to McAllister. So they have the new midfield, I say. They lost Jordan Henderson and Fabinho over the summer. But we're not sure about that midfield yet. Same thing with Chelsea. Chelsea have bought a whole lot of players, but it's their new team in that sense because they brought lots of players and also let go of a lot of players. So it's really interesting. You're looking at two teams who are not sure of where they are coming into the season. So it's really, really interesting, this fixture. Interesting fixtures there. Liverpool, Chelsea, both of them are already dragging, as you mentioned, over Caicedo. And uh, right now, we saw at least some players leaving Liverpool. Uh, don't you think that will have a lot of effect? Although we know Chelsea might not be at their best yet, uh, but uh, that uh, Firmino, Henderson, uh, all of them leaving uh, Liverpool, won't, don't you think it will have a lot of big effect on that club? Yeah, yeah, like I rightly pointed out earlier, um, Henderson and Fabinho have been stewards of the club. They won the Premier League, won the Champions League with them. So you lose that experience. And yes, you've gotten quality players in Slobodan Sly and McAllister, World Cup winner McAllister. But how do they integrate into the squad? It's You don't just move out your midfield in one summer and bring in a whole set of players. It's it's the way football works. You need time to acclimatize. I mean, granted, Liverpool will come out the block flying and have a wonderful season. But... Um, it's difficult, so they will have that acclimatizing time, or they will need to have that acclimatization time. Further, um, you mentioned Firmino, who, who was brilliant yesterday in his debut for Alali, but I think they had already moved beyond Firmino, even as a last season with the signings of Gakbo and Lewis, and um, um, what's his name? Um, Darwin Nunez, yes, thank you. Darwin Nunez, yes. I think they had moved beyond, they had moved beyond Firmino at that point. So I'm not too worried about the attack. It's more of the midfield. I have, and which for Chelsea, Chelsea, yeah, Chelsea are all over the place. They are scoring because you look, it's a whole new team. They bought defenders. They bought mid, okay. They just have Enzo, but their midfield they've lost. They lost Kovacic over the summer. Um, striker they have Jackson, Nicholas Jackson, who was impressive during preseason, but you are still not sure. Also, they have Mauricio Pochettino, who's yes, we know he did brilliant with Tottenham Hotspur. It's probably going to do well at Chelsea, but. It's a new team. So, with Chelsea, everything's probably relatively new, or most things are relatively new. However, it's still Chelsea. You do expect they will compete. You don't expect them to have the type of season they had last year. So these are the factors. I mean, 
the game on Sunday doesn't define how the season will go. It's just one. The other 37 other games to play. But for Sunday, I really don't know. I actually go for a draw with this one. We actually go for a draw with this one. A big one between Liverpool and Chelsea. We've been looking at that game. It's the biggest for this weekend in the English Premier League there. And Charles Adria, joining us from Bayern, has been talking about that particular uh, team. And now, uh, let's cross. Let's just leave Chelsea and Liverpool. Let's just look at the other fixtures. You look at Arsenal. Arsenal, uh, they will be opening their own game against uh, Nottingham Forest uh, at home uh, over there at the uh, Emirates Stadium. Well, do you think they can win this? Because uh, now that uh, Man City, they've actually started with that particular big win. That could push Arsenal to be like, OK, we too want to start well by winning this game. Um, yeah, I think Arsenal are good for today. Uh, with great respect to Nottingham Forest. I think Arsenal coming in with a lot of expectation coming into the season with Arsenal based off what happened last year. It's in the same time, they've gotten, I mean, got Kai Havertz. Um, they got Declan Rice, the big, big, I think that was their most important signing so far to my mind, Declan Rice. And yeah, granted, they lost Gabriel Jesus due to knee injury. But I think for today and maybe the first few weeks of the season, they will be fine. I think they will see past. It's the Emirates' first game of the season. I think Arsenal will put on champagne football for everyone. And yeah, for the fans, hopefully for their sake. And yeah, it should be a good game for them. I think it's it will be a good game for Arsenal. I love that champagne football that you mentioned for Arsenal. <laughs> the fans out there. I uh, see so looking at the fixtures there. Look at Newcastle. We saw what they did last season. I really uh, surprised everyone. They were hosting Aston Villa at the St. James Park. Another big match at the Bowery Howe rather there uh, will be hosting that team. And we know what Aston Villa can do at any time. They can be very, very funny when they play football. When you just close your eyes, they, they will do so well at times. When you give them that particular opportunity, they blow it. Now, Newcastle, another match that we're looking at uh, from the way it is. I uh, expect them to win or draw from you. Um, with this, I'm not quite sure about this game. I'm not quite sure about these two teams over the course of the season. They're interested, interested in the sense Newcastle did well last year to make to make the Champions League. Um, they've made some really smart signings, I would say, with the signing of um, Sandro Tonali, um, Liveramonto from Southampton, which I think was a decent addition. So there's expectancy that Newcastle um, should do well in the league. But then again, you have the thing where they have Champions League. Champions League football to as a distraction of some sort. Then you look at Aston Villa, who made good strides. I think under Emery, if you were to take the league table based on when Emery came in last season, they probably finished second or third in the league. And now they've made some really smart signings as well. Paolo, Paolo Torres, um, Yuri Tillemans. So there's the... What would I say? There's an expectancy around Aston Villa that maybe they should be pushing for a Europa League spot this year. So I think both teams were going into this season with high expectations, high hopes. And but for this game on Sat on on today, I'll probably give it to Newcastle. Um St. James Park, the ground with St. James Park with buzzing, the euphoria for new season, new signings. I'll give it to, to Newcastle, but it's going to be a really tough game. A really tough game is going to be between Newcastle and Axton Villa. Now, let's look at a team who won't be with their former star striker, talking about Tottenham All Sport. Right now, their main man has gone to join Bayern Munich, Harry Kane, moving over to Germany. Now, they will be playing a way uh, against Brentford. That will be the first time. Uh, uh, don't you think that will hit them, uh, hit the entire squad, that uh, their main star player is gone? Um, naturally, I mean, Harry Kane's goes, he's, he's almost hard to replace that, is it? But, I mean, as the manager said yesterday, um, they've been working hard, or they've had that, should I say, they expected this to happen at some point, and he's worked, according to his press conference at least, he's prepared this whole preseason and looking to the season without Harry Kane. So in his mind, Harry Kane was going to be an extra addition, he did stay. And having said that, I actually watched a couple of Tottenham games over the preseason. They were really decent. Like they played better, they played good football, crisp football. I think Tottenham may surprise a few of us because now everyone is Harry Kane is gone. It, the way they finished last season was not so good. But it, I really think Tottenham may, may, don't hold me on this, may so may surprise us this season. And yeah, I mean, for this game in particular, Brentford, Brentford, obviously, as we all know, they are still without Ivan Tony. So it's a tale of two. Two teams without their main strikers, uh, should I say. Um, but on this one, let me be cheeky and say I'll give Brentford the win. 
Why? Simply because you know how football goes. I think Brentford will probably get the win and everyone starts going. Tottenham need to get a striker. Hurricane, they're going to miss Hurricane, this and that. But Brentford, let's not forget Brentford play really good football and they're a really decent team. And I think, yeah, the shock of the Hurricane leaving may just do Tottenham, do Tottenham in today. But I think over the course of the season, they will have enough to be competitive. I don't know if that will make them qualify for Champions League. That's a different story. But I think Tottenham will surprise a lot of us because not many people expect Tottenham to do well this season. But I think they'll give it a good go. Well, hopefully, let's see what Tottenham Hotspur will do post Harry Kane there. As uh, their main man has gone, it's no longer their man now, but uh, their former record holder. All right, now we uh, uh, let's switch from uh, Premier League. Let's talk about La Liga, where you you actually have your giant Real Madrid. <laughs> they will be playing. Uh, they will be facing Atletico Bilbao uh, in their first game of the season. We saw what happened last season. They fought hard, but uh, well, Barcelona nipping it in the board against them. Real Madrid, uh, the Galactic Galacticos against Bilbao in an away game. Uh, your team, I know you are a Galacticos, so how do you feel about this game? Honestly, I'm not really confident at all. Serious? Why? Why? Why are you not confident? Uh, I'm not confident about the game. I'm too about the season. Why? Because it's a f first of all, you heard the news that broke out about two, three years ago. Thibaut Courtois for his ACL, so he's probably out till about April. Arguably, to my mind, the best goalkeeper in the world. He saved us numerous times. Um, probably the reason why we made, we made certain progress at certain points last year. Um, so now he's out. There's this uncertainty about who's the goalkeeper. Are we using our second choice keeper, Lunin? Are we getting a new keeper? Talk of David De Gea, talk of Yasin Bono from Sevilla. So there's that uncertainty. But tonight, we know with Andrea Lunin going and go. So there's that. Also, we lost Karim Benzema, the top, the second highest goal scorer in Real Madrid's history, top assist in Real Madrid's history. That's a ma the current Ballon d'Or winner, lest we forget. That's um, that's a massive loss, and we haven't been able to replace him. Yes, we got Jose Lu from Espanol, but Jose Lu, um, who was I think third highest goal scorer in La Liga last year, but the intention was at least Jose to be a backup striker because we lacked that, should I say, backup striker. But now you're going in whereby. He's what brought in as a backup striker, but we, we do not have a main striker. Talk of Kylian Mbappe here and there, but the fact of the matter is Kylian Mbappe is a PS Paris Saint Germain player as of today, as of now. And and he's saying he wants to stay. So yeah, Carlo Ancelotti went on record yesterday during his press conference saying he feels the attack is okay. I just feel he's saying that, but he says he feels the attack is okay. We preseason wasn't as great. The Real Madrid fans were not happy with the preseason results. The attack looked, um, the lack of structure with it, with the 4-4-2 Diamond, Vinicius and Rodrigo, who are typically wingers, having to play centrally, so you could see them trying to acclimatise and settle into the new position, so to speak. And yeah, so I think it would be a very long season. For except we, we actually do end up signing Mbappe, it may be a really, really long season. But for today's game, Bilbao has been typically, Sam Mamez has been typically uh, a tough ground to go. Funny enough, Karim Benzema had a really pretty good record there. I, I can't remember the stats exactly, but he used to score there almost every time. So now he's gone and no goalkeeper. Difficult place. I'm expecting a, a bit of a win tonight. So you're not really too confident by your team. It's obvious, sir. <laughs> even from your voice. <laughs> it can happen in the world of football. You can't predict yeah. even though your best goalkeeper uh, is right now injured. Uh, talking about uh, Couture. Well, hopefully, maybe the game will be coming in. It seems uh, they are edging closer. Let's, let me give you that uh, hope there. <laughs> now, talking about uh, La Liga, another game uh, that's uh, Real Sociedad versus Giro. Now we have a Nigerian, Sadiq Umar. Umar will be back at least after getting injured since September last year. Uh, he's back to his feet now. And uh, uh, we're happy that the Nigerian striker will be able to at least uh, man his position against uh, Girona. Yeah, it was it was it was sad for to see because last year he moved from Almera to to so that big money move as well. So there was this expectation. I was really keen on seeing Sadiq and how he performed, um, taking that step up. Would I say because he did well in the um, Liga, the second division, Segunda, the Segunda division. So I was really. Interesting seeing how he performed with Sosida last year, Laria last year. Um, so the ACL injury was a terrible blow. So now he's back. Sosida have a 
this impetus. Also, they have um, their skipper back. Um, what's his name now? Sorry, just um, their captain. I can't remember his name at this moment, but they have him back as well because he was also out for a long period of time. So I think Sussex are actually set, looking up, setting up for a good season for them. Girona, yeah, last year they they rode their luck a bit, but stayed in the division. And for this game, I think Sussex will have enough to see past them at the Anueta. Well, right now we're talking La Liga, and just to give you updates, uh, Australia France match seems to be very tough. They will be going the way England and Nigeria actually went. They'll be going on penalty shootout. A tough one there, playing goalless at the World Cup for women. Uh, really a tough one for the host, and also France uh, really making themselves play tough football there. And now let's uh, uh, let's take one more. Uh, French league one also uh, is starting. Uh, we'll we have matches that will be coming up there. PSG, yes, uh, their main man, uh, Kylian Mbappe, is having issues concerning that team uh, seems uh, is uh, leaving or staying it's not certain a lot of issues concerning PSG and they will be playing against Lorient uh, well uh, Charles uh, this is a particular player that ought to have moved last season but he stayed with uh, PSG and everything crumbled this season and right now uh, staying or not staying is really having a big toll because uh, a lot of uh, stories are coming up from PSG clear Mbappe story Qu quickly Um, well, this is a story that we've seen it for the past three summers, 20, 20, 2021. It was a situation whereby Real Madrid beat 100 million. Kylian Mbappé came out to say press conference he wants to leave. The money is there. It's a substantial, substantial amount of money. But PSG said no. They kept him well within their rights to do that. Next, last summer, it was a situation whereby his contract was running out. He was set to sign for Real Madrid. Then a lot of things went behind the scenes. A lot of, should I say, some will say political pressure, and Kylian signs on for two years, a two two plus one deal. And now this summer, he has come out to say this contract ends next summer, and categorically he is not extended that contract. He wants to leave, but Paris Saint Germain are now saying no, we can't let you leave for free. You're the best player in the world. We need to recoup some sort of money for you. And everyone knows that everyone knows basically that Kylian Mbappe's dream is to join Real Madrid. Thing now is Real Madrid haven't come in for a bid. For him. And it's a difficult situation all parties find themselves because PSG wants to let him go. Kylian Mbappe is okay. I mean, it's city, Paris, his city, his club. He say, says he loves the club. He wants to stay. He said that he wants to actually stay and fulfill the last year of his contract. But there's the financial aspect of it where PSG needs to recoup money, needs to get his wages off the wage bill. If he, because he just can't financially, it's going to be a disaster for them to let him go for free. And while still having to pay him his loyalty bonuses, there was talk about them owing him, I think, a 40 million loyalty bonus at, on, as at 1st of August, and another one at the 31st of August. So those, I think it's a money issue on this one. It's really interesting to see how it plays out. Personally, I think it's a 50-50 thing. I think Real Madrid come in for, with a reasonable amount of money. Mbappe, we, are, we give the green light to that PSG clearly wants him gone. He's, he's, Luis Enrique has come out to say he's not going to be in the score for tomorrow. He's still with the undesirables, quote unquote. And yeah, they're trying to, should I say, force him out? We're actually in an incredible position whereby PSG are probably going to lose Messi, Neymar, and Mbappe in the same summer, which is really incredible when you think about it. But it may be a good thing for the club in the long run, trying to rebuild on, should I say, on a team rather than individuals. But yeah, going back to Mbappe, it's, really, it's crazy to think we're in this position whereby the best player in the world is being forced out of this club and there are no buyers. Or should I say, he doesn't want to move. And it's, it's a really, should I say, not a good situation for all parties involved, I would say. Not a good situation at all for Mbappe and PSG right now. We've been looking at those matches today for this weekend as uh, matches are back. Uh, if you love football, watch those games. And now, let's take the last one with you before we allow people to call in. Uh, we'll, we'll be done with you after this particular one, uh, Charles. Let's talk about the boxing bout coming up uh, tonight between Anthony Joshua and Robert Hellenius, the one they call the Nord Nightmare. A big one there, quickly. Yeah, the Nordic Nightmare. It's uh... She says it's a, it's a match that's come surprised in a way because um, Joshua was supposed to take on was, th was supposed to take on Philip Erichovic, but he was sorry, it was Dillian White, sorry, he was taking on Dillian White and he was um, found culpable for drugs for cheating, should I say? And yeah, and Helene is actually, if I remember correctly, had a fight last weekend in Finland, 
So he's fresh, but obviously he wasn't prepared, so to speak, for this match with Joshua. And for Joshua himself, it's obviously he wasn't training for this opponent. So I think it's in that aspect, it's tricky for boats. It's tricky for both um, um, boxers. But having said that, they're professionals. I'm sure they will bring their A game to. They'll bring their A game to the ring, and. Yeah, it should be a good match. What's interesting, I was actually th- uh, just thinking about this match. The last time this just a surprise, surprise uh, opponent came up for both for both uh, boxers was Andy Ruiz Jr. for Anthony Joshua, where he lost, yeah. lost the title by the way. And for Elinos, it was against Deontay Wilder. He lost as well. Which there are rumors that after if Joshua were to beat Elinos today, the, his next match for this year will be against. Deontay Wilder. So you have those, I say, subplots within this within this match. But I would say Joshua wins it probably in five rounds today. He is, to my mind at least, he's faster, quicker, better, ring IQ. Yes, Helenius is, like I said, he's fresher, the fresher man, considering he fought just last weekend. But there are questions concerning his durability, especially at this point of his career. So I will give it to Anthony Joshua. I think he, he gives he gets a win that will be well needed for his confidence. And yeah, on to the next. Hopefully, Anthony Joshua will win the fight there. Coming from Charles Adria, who joined us from Bern, Switzerland. Thank you so much, Charles. And you look fresh. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I had to be a lovely to be back with the studio with you. It's been my absolute pleasure. Good one. Well, we just uh, quickly give you updates concerning those matches now. Let's allow two, I think, two, three Nigerians to call in uh, concerning these two topics. We're looking at Anthony Joshua will be fighting against Robert Helenius uh, tonight over there at the O2 Arena in London. Uh, a big fight there. I just uh, we want uh, your contribution, uh, one or two. And also Liverpool versus Chelsea this weekend. Uh, that will be on Sunday. A big one there. Another fight. Another big fight there do in, in football. So we have two stories. You know, Anthony Joshua, do you think he can win tonight, even though? He was supposed to fight against uh, Dillian White, but that uh, uh, particular one won't happen. He had to bring another person because he tested positive to ban substance. That's uh, Robert Hellenius will be facing Anthony Joshua tonight. A big one for him. Can he win? Well, we hope so that uh, he will win, just like Charles Adju Adju actually said. Well, Joshua will be fighting tonight. Liverpool, Chelsea, who wins that battle also. Uh, that will be on Sunday. Call us and let's have that. Uh, any one of the topics that you want us to talk about, uh, is it Liverpool? Is it uh, Anthony Joshua? You can just dial the that number in there. While we're looking at that, let's quickly look at the head-to-head -head of uh, Joshua versus, uh, uh, versus Robert Elenius. Now, let's look at that head-to-head -head of Joshua versus uh, Elenius while we look at uh, Liverpool uh, versus uh, Chelsea also. Well, uh, age-wise, uh, Anthony Joshua is 33. The man is 39. The one they call Nord Nightmare. Anthony Joshua with, uh, has won 28 fights. Uh, Elenius has won 36, 32, 25. Uh, they actually had uh, uh, three losses for Joshua and four for Hellenius. Knockout, 22, and for Hellenius is 21. By height, six by six for the Finnish uh, boxer. The same height that the, both of them have. And you look at their weight. Well, right now, uh, 115 uh, that's the category uh, kg weight by that's Anthony Joshua uh, the same amount of weight just slightly by one and you look at uh, reach 79 inches reach 80 89 82 for Anthony Joshua AJ as it's being called and the Nordic nightmare will be facing him tonight well a big one there and also uh, if you look at the way it is right now both of them are battle ready even though it's impromptu because they just have to quickly get a particular boxer to fight against Joshua after the Leon White fight collapsed. But that will be a big one there uh, between the two uh, of them tonight at the O2 Arena. The Liverpool will be taking on uh, Chelsea uh, tomorrow. Well, uh, we just uh, do have to take this up. Okay, looking at the head-to-head -head of Liverpool-Chelsea. You look at the record in the Premier League, 58 so far, 23 for Liverpool, 21 uh, for Chelsea. Goal, 73 for Chelsea, 70. And you have clean sheets uh, for Chelsea, 17. And for Liverpool, it's 15. A big one there. And uh, really, it seems uh, both of them are about to ready for these games. Let's see who stays on to win that particular game there. We have a caller there. Hello. Hello, good to have you on the show. 
Okay, uh, we actually, okay, uh, I'm still waiting for one or uh, two people to call in to say their mind concerning Joshua Fire tonight and also Liverpool Chelsea, where we hope that uh, uh, Anthony Joshua will be able to win that fight tonight. A big one there. Uh, we seem uh, uh, just to give you updates concerning transfers while we're waiting for that. Uh, let's talk about Katsina United. Katsina United unveils uh, Tony Bolus as coach. Uh, he signs other players like uh, Chidera Eze, Adebambo, Seidu and Akim Oladun all joining Katsina United after they unveiled their new coach in the person of uh, Tony Bolus. He will be with that team. And right now, Katsina United are about to already sign a different player with their colorful jersey. Uh, beautiful jersey. They are really showcasing Africa in that jersey. They are ready for the MPFL next season for Tony Bolus and all the players they are signed so far. Let's see what they can do. We have a call up there. Good to have you on the show. Hello, are you there? Okay, we were waiting for you. Let's uh, see, run through some transfer story. But before then, let's talk about Kevin Prince. Uh, Bo uh, Boateng. Uh, before Boateng, uh, yes, Harry Kane has joined Bayern Munich. At least Bayern are happy now. Finally, they got their man for 95 million pounds. It has been done. He's no longer a Tottenham player. He's now a German uh, player, I'd rather buy Bayern Munich player in German Bundesliga. Congrats to Bayern Munich to get him. And now let's talk about Kevin Prince Boateng, announced retirement from football at 36. Boateng has played with 15 different clubs and now he has retired from football at 36. Well, good one for him. Chelsea prepares British record, £115 million for Brighton's Moise Caicedo. That's the player that has caused drama now. Liverpool bid it 111 and Chelsea had to up their own to 115. Let's see where it's going. He said his mind is with Chelsea. Uh, not talking about Mikel, <laughs> Man United, Chelsea saga there. Well, uh, let's quickly talk about the last one. Manchester City to make another bid for West Ham Lucas Paqueta. Paqueta after rejecting £70 million, while well, they will be going for another one. They want to go to get, they really want to get uh, Paqueta to join them over there in Manchester City at Etihad Stadium precisely. Well, a big one there for those players who are right now moving and for coaches who are also moving from one close to the other. The league matches have started now. Let's see who stays up and who stays down. For Manchester City, They've started so well on a very good note, and they want to continue there. Well, for all those teams in Nigeria who are also training ahead of the league season in Nigeria, August 26th, we are waiting for the MPFL to come up, and hopefully it will happen. For Anthony Joshua against Elenios tonight, we wish him all the best. Hopefully, he can knock him out in first or second round there. That will be it on Weekend Sport, where we always give you the best when it comes to sporting activities. I'm Adeni Ajishafe. Sport is always business and fitness. Thanks for watching.